can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. In these two questions, in this question and this answer, I would like to focus my reflection this morning in this gospel passage and also the first reason. Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ, both now and forever. Amen. Happy New Year to all of you. Since after Christmas, we have been reading from the letter of St. John, and for some days now, we have also been reading the Gospel of John, still the first chapter. John is usually described as a theologian, and in these verses of the first chapter, we see a lot of John's theology and Christology. Aside from the prologue that is itself very dense and upon which we can meditate for the rest of our life, we also have this encounter, the first encounter of Jesus with John, with the first disciples, telling us a lot about the person of Jesus. So many titles trying to describe his personality. John yesterday, in the gospel of yesterday, calls him the Lamb of God. And later still, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The first disciples refer to him simply as rabbi, master. But after the first encounter with him, Andrew is certain to have found the Messiah, the Christ. Then today, we hear of him being called him about whom the prophets spoke. And we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Philip had just met Jesus for, one, for his, an instant, for some time. And yet, he says, it's about him that Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. And later, Nathaniel, who begins with a doubt based on prejudice, I will come to that, refers to him as again master, son of God, king of Israel. Andrew and Philip bore witness to the person of Christ. Nathaniel's was higher than or deeper than a wit witnessing. It was a profession of faith. Here, for the first time, we find Jesus referred to as the Son of God. In the synoptics, King of Israel is mockery. A mockery, a title of mockery of Jesus. But in John's Gospel, it is not. But Jesus, as if he hadn't heard this title, maybe because the time, the hour had not come, a term that will then reoccur re re along the line, just refers to himself as the Son of Man. Okay, Lamb of God. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. The Messiah, King of Israel, Son of God, Son of Man. 
But for John, there is another thing here. Very important. As we read in his letters, especially the first chapters, that we have been also reading in these days, talking about the Antichrist. Remember, he says the Antichrist is anybody who does not believe that Jesus really came in the flesh as man. So here he described him as Nathaniel, I mean, Philip says, he is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip presented to Nathaniel a man son of Joseph, a, Nazareth, a man from Nazareth. But Nathaniel experienced the Son of God. And we know both the divinity of Christ and his humanity are very important, not just for John, but for all of us. Let us leave aside the controversy around the person of Nathaniel that appears only twice in the gospel and both of them in John, this time and then in John chapter 21. Tradition has identified him with Bartholomew. Others have said he is not a historical figure. But we won't worry about that for now. There are two things I want to just mention briefly and leave you to your meditation. The first is the question asked by Nathaniel. From Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Pure prejudice. And this is the problem all of us have as human beings. And I want to invite you to accept it is a problem for you, but also to know that prejudice is not, first of all, it is natural, inevitable, but it is not always bad. But beyond that, that there is a journey possible, made possible, not in spite of the prejudice, but precisely because of the prejudice or prejudices. So now today we have to think of how to deal with our prejudices. Spoken in English, prejudice, we seem to forget it has to do with judgment, judicio. Prejudicio in Italian. Préjugement in French, Vorurteil in German, all about judgment. And this judgment can be epistemic or epistemological, but it can also be moral. Judgment, epistemological judgment is judgment about what is true. Is this true? To judge the truth of reality or statement you have to base it on information you have or your experience of the information, however you obtained the experience. Then moral judgment is about what is right or wrong, or what is good or bad. And that is about action. Because it is based on that judgment then that we choose the right conduct. Every choice is based on our assessment of what is being chosen. Every adult human being knows based on pre-knowledge. That is that our prejudices are the basic fundamental conditions of our knowing. This was brought out clearly, if you remember, by people like Gadamer. You don't know from nothing. For you, that is why the difficulty about the blind man who was cured by Jesus and he said, I see men, but they are like trees. Was he born blind or did he recover his sight 
after having lost it after some time. Otherwise, how did he know the difference between men and trees if he hadn't seen trees before? But all of us as adults often have ideas because our prejudgment, our prejudices or prior judgments could be based on our imagination because human imagination is creative imagination that goes beyond what has been perceived. Or on previous information, which may or may not be correct. But at least there is a basic point of departure that conditions but does not determine every subsequent knowledge or judgment. man can't do this. Have you ever had that type of thing? Prejudice. Hey, fulani kwa. How can a fulani person do this? How can you marry from Eke? Na maro kandi eke siyeme. Ola maro ndi udindi abaja. Unkano, these Igbo people say, Yoruba, how's that? These are all previous judgments we had arrived at about persons, groups of persons, areas. Some of us who studied in Europe and America, you know that when you score your, you score your first A, sometimes the teacher has to examine it again to know whether it was really your score. Black man from Nigeria, he must have copied. A number of times, the results from our seminaries were questioned at the Urbaniana because they were too good to be real, and some were cancelled. Prejudice. Prejudice. For hope time. What did Nathaniel think about Nazareth that made him conclude nothing good could come of it? Even individual priests, individual brothers, individual sisters, there are members of your family from whom you don't, you conclude whatever the person says is a lie. Whatever he does is wrong or is selfish. Because you have conditioned yourself to perceive that brother or sister in a particular way. I invite all of us to be aware of our prejudices. If you say you are not prejudiced, you are telling yourself a lie. Just like John says, if you say without sin, you are a liar. You are calling God a liar. Now, if you are aware of those prejudices then you can make good use of them and deal with them in a very constructive way. And one way of dealing with prejudices, or two ways, one, to recognize them as real, two, to be open, remain open and say, I think I don't know that president of U.S. who was said to have told Americans, fellow Americans, always consider it possible that you might be wrong. Two, you remain open. The information I have may not be complete. There is this statement I repeat often. As far as I know, but as far as I know, is not the farthest that can be known. Leave that open, openness. In that way, your pre-knowledge or pre-judgment conditions but does not determine your relationship with the truth which was the case of Nathaniel. Jesus, though, through his grace, disposed Nathaniel because he encountered him even before Nathaniel got to know him. And that positive word disposed Nathaniel to a profession of faith. Sometimes we are sent to parishes and you conclude already this is a difficult parish and you don't know one single person in that parish. 
Or you go into a parish and they conclude you are a problematic priest and you have not yet dealt with any of them. So this is a universal problem. But the experience of Nathaniel today tells us that it is not definitive. Allow yourself to encounter the reality, to encounter the truth with an open heart, especially a loving heart. Not just from the point of view of epistemology of knowledge, but from the point of view of love, from the point of view of action, of right and wrong, of good and evil. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. What made this possible? I have a special love for Andrew and Philip. And you know my Episcopal motto. We want to see Jesus. Refers to their ministry. Ministry of leading people to encounter Jesus. Philip was not there when Jesus was met by the first two apostles. One of them was Andrew. And they asked Jesus, where do you live? The same words, come and see. Jesus leaves the region entirely and moves north towards Galilee and encounters Philip. And the next person that Philip draws to Jesus, Andrew drew Peter. The next person raised a difficult problem. He didn't argue with him. Come and see. And his first encounter with the Lord was a profession of faith. You know, we have a problem now in the church, both as a body and within our various groups. What do we do to keep our members, including our priests, to be interested in what they can't be punished about or they are not punished about, no matter how good it is? The answer, an encounter with Christ transforms. If in anything we organize as church or as groups in the church, people see it as an, a possibility of real encounter with the person of Christ, that encounter is enough to transform the person more than any other regulation, regulation or sanction. So is it possible that we as Christians live our lives in such a way that the only argument we can present to another person is come and experience Christ yourself. Come and experience the alumni association yourself. Come and experience the Presbyterian meeting yourself. If that is not working, then we still have to ask ourselves questions about our life and our witnessing. But you, being led to that encounter, in spite of your prejudice, remain open for surprises. And John, in the first reading, warns us about the danger of a hardened heart. A hardened heart that is no longer able to love. And the danger of that hardness of heart is real for ministers of the gospel. There is a real problem for us as priests. The way we are trained in this part of the world runs the risk of making us emotionally self-centered, emotionally egoist, and having an undue sense of entitlement without an equivalent commitment to sharing of our lives in love. That is what John wants us against. 
in the first reading. If we are not prepared to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, if our priesthood is only about our convenience, about our entitlements and rights, then we are probably going to be like Cain, who murdered his brother. Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. It requires prayer, but it also requires faith and openness. In spite of whatever may have conditioned our relationship with God or with one another, if we remain open to a true encounter with Christ and with our neighbor, if we experience Christ the way Philip and Nathaniel did, we will not only also invite others, we will not only profess Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel and King of the universe, but we will also lead other people to encounter him. Can anything good come out of him? Can anything good come out of this place? Come and see.